important changes uh, that are happening in the state of Colorado. And so the purpose of today is to provide some education um, and knowledge about what these changes are going to be, what they mean, um, and how you can respond. Who we are as an organization uh, is a, a mission-driven team of professionals who seek to simplify the complex nature of um, quality, compliance, risk management, operations. I'm the former director of operations of a full continuum of care treatment facility in Boulder, Colorado called North Star. And uh, in living that problem of licensing and accreditation um, management, I you know, created this company to try to help organizations navigate that, knowing that it's only gonna become more and more complex. Um, really pleased to be joined here uh, with Nikki Rutger, who's been with us for a couple of years now since the early stages of our business. And um, she's going to be the subject matter expert going into some of the granular details of the BHA changes um, and also deliver services to the customers that we work with in the state of Colorado and beyond to navigate um, a lot of the different, uh, you know, regulatory expectations that they have, whether it be licensing, accreditation, or payer specific. Uh, we also have a best in class software tool, very easy to use, very inexpensive, helps to streamline the day-to-day -day operations and de facto keep the organization in compliance. So in regards to the specific changes, um, Colorado basically um, for a few years now has been planning and executing on the specific changes and there's two um, that are most notable. So the creation of the Behavioral Health Administration which is ultimately replacing any kind of need for the Office of Behavioral Health, which has ultimately been dissolved by the Colorado state government and the establishment of the BHA, the Behavioral Health Administration, seeks to simplify the process of provider licensing, um, pull all of the different services mm -hmm. under one regulatory umbrella, and also increase and expand the standards to be more in line with ASAM, to be more in line with Joint Commission accreditation, and really for the state to be able to access more federal dollars to stimulate the Medicaid market um, and to provide additional uh, modalities of treatment in the state that may not exist um, or have existed in the past. So in uh, the previous administration under the Office of Behavioral Health, organized, organizations were licensed um, through designations, whether they be substance abuse, mental health. Um, a lot of these were outdated. The, Regulations were quite thin in relation to a lot of other states, and uh, Colorado, for various reasons, decided to do something about it. So House Bill 22-1278 was created um, really for the Behavioral Health Administration and the Department of Human Services. The goal is to create a coordinated, cohesive, and effective behavioral health care system in the state. Those of you that have operated in Colorado for years know um, that there have been a number of attempted changes in using different systems. Um, Ladders has provided some benefits and also some challenges. And one of the main efforts, uh, you know, goals of the efforts behind this change is really to create a more uh, cohesive relationship between um, the government and the providers to improve the quality of care and also improve the effectiveness of how the two uh, stakeholders work together. So the BHA is gonna handle the majority of the behavioral health programs that were previously handled by the Office of Behavioral Health, including some additional programs and modalities that were not previously regulated under the Office of Behavioral Health. So the act requires for the BHA to establish by July 1st of this year, four specific systems. One being a statewide behavioral health grievance system, a behavioral health performance monitoring system, which is a huge, huge part of the way that regulation should be written and purpose to be able to increase safety and quality over time. A comprehensive behavioral safety net system and a regionally based behavioral health administrative service organization approach. So um, about a half of a year ago, the BHA began the licensing functions. They kicked the can down the road a couple different times we know that the wheels of the government can turn slow, although they do continue to turn. Um, and on July of this year, the BHA will officially become the licensing authority for the state. So 
from here on, I'm going to kick it over to Nikki. Um, Nikki, you just tell me when to move towards the next slides as you go through your presentation. All right, let's jump into it. Uh, so Parker mentioned we had, you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, the new rules for the Behavioral Health Administration went into effect on January 1st of this year, and they're organized now into 12 chapters. Um, that sounds a little bit intimidating, but they, they're really organized so uh, to make things easier. And I think once organizations get used to that, it's you're going to really like it. Uh, the new rules, Parker mentioned, are really aligned with Joint Commission standards now. So organizations that are already accredited by Joint Commission will probably have a, a much easier time um, bringing their policies and procedures and operations into alignment with the new rules. Um, those who aren't, there is a, a lot of work that is ahead of you. Um, the Colorado rules were thin, um, before the change. Now, uh, in my opinion, they are best in class. They're some of the best rules I've seen. Uh, and some of those rules even supersede Joint Commission uh, requirements. So it, it, you really, I just, I can't overemphasize, uh, don't take it lightly. The bar has been raised. Uh, it is going to result in better client care and increased safety for clients and staff and also reduce liability for behavioral health organizations, uh, but it is a lot. Um, so that said, most organizations will only need to work in a handful of the 12 chapters. Chapter one goes into all of the definitions that apply to behavioral health. Uh, chapter two are the rules that apply to all organizations, regardless of what level of care or what type of program you are delivering. And then chapters three through 12 uh, go into the specific program and level of care standards. So outpatient, IOP, and PHP rules are all in chapter four. If you do res residential or overnight care, those are uh, in chapter five. And that's regardless of whether you are providing uh, mental health services or SUD services. Then the other rules are things like um, services specific to children and families or women in maternal behavioral health. Uh, there's a uh, multiple programs there. Another change that comes along with these new rules is the licensing term is one year instead of two years. Um, that said, some providers are going to be eligible to have that survey cycle extended up to three years if certain uh, requirements are in place. And those are mostly uh, the length of time that the organization has been licensed and if they are free of um, things like uh, conditions on the license and patterns of rule violations or significant deficiencies that can impact client safety. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, we can Nikki, move on. If you to... wouldn't mind, I'm just going to do a quick summary of some of those big bullet points and, um, you know, give the kind of high level reality of the situation. So mm -hmm. ultimately, these rule changes are going to ideally improve the patient experience and hold organizations to a higher standard of accountability around their compliance and operational clinical medical practices. The previous version of the rules for behavioral health in Colorado was about 160, 180 pages. Uh, the new rules is close to 400 pages. So the harsh reality is that the amount of work that needs to be done relative to your state license is going to be about double. And the term that you're licensed for, at least initially, is going to be half of what it was. So it used to be a two-year cycle unless it was a controlled substance um, license for withdrawal management, but you can, through what Nikki described, demonstrate to the state through quality practices and adherence to the rules and create an extended period of time of when they come back. And I think everybody on this call would be in favor of less site visits from the state body. So the rules are expanding. They're becoming much more difficult and strenuous. The amount of time that you're licensed by the state is less until you can show them that they don't need to come out every year. And so getting ahead of this now, adopting it effectively, 
and then executing on the different requirements is going to put you in the best position long term to not have to move through a regulatory audit um, on an annual basis. Okay, so existing providers um, are going to be issued a provisional license under the new rules, but everybody is going to need to apply for a behavioral health entity licensure with the BHA under the initial licensing rules. That means everybody's going to get a new uh, ladders account. There is uh, There are new licensing requirements that are in place now. So that process is going to look like um, it's going to begin with the submission of a letter of intent. Um, and then there are new fingerprinting requirements for uh, the organization's executive director or owner. Um, another new licensing requirement that falls under um, BHA or BHE licensure is a application for a cer certificate of compliance from the Division of Fire Protection. That does not take the place of the local fire inspection. It's a new requirement on top of that. Um, those are all things, and we'll get into, you know, what should I do first a little bit later in the presentation, but those are all things that if you are an existing organization, I'd go ahead and get that started now. Um, there, there are things that will delay your license um, if they're not in place and they're easy to overlook. Um, the other thing, another thing that uh, the BHA has um, said is that they're going to give existing organizations a significant amount of latitude and grace with enforcement of the new rules, at least for the first half of the year. They're calling that delayed enforcement. Um, and it sounds fantastic, uh, but I would not take a, a whole lot of comfort in that because six months is not a huge amount of time when we're considering the enormous amount of change that's coming into play with these new regulations. Um, so the other thing that we'll be recommending for uh, providers is to get started on that policy and procedure update and a, a detailed review of the rules so you can get those new requirements embedded into your organization's operations right away. Uh, this is not something to wait until March or April or May uh, to do because your policy and procedure manual is essentially going to need to be reviewed and updated from top to bottom. Um, there was a, a question that came in from Emily about rule references. Um, and Emily, we'll, we'll put in the, uh, in the chat window for everybody a, uh, a link to the new rules. The chapter references are different. I'm not sure off the top of my head if the CCR number is uh, is different as well, uh, but the, the rule numbers themselves definitely are. Yeah, so we'll circulate those out. Um, notable that there is a bit of a grace period. That six months is almost down to five. So um, the, the, the clock is ticking, and so acting on this sooner than later and drawing out the changes um, and adoption over you know, the course of the next five months is really gonna be what sets you up for, for more of that long-term success. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, not so much the things that are updated for specific levels of care or, or specific programs, but the things that, are, that apply across the board, we're gonna hit some of the highlights. Um, the first thing to mention is critical incidents. There's a really significant expansion of what qualifies as a critical incident that needs to be reported up to the BHA. And this is one notable exception to the um, delayed enforcement rule. So these rules are already in place. And uh, if you have one of these incidents occur in your organization, you are already falling under uh, the new uh, rule requirements for critical incident reporting. Um, so reportable incidents still includes uh, confidentiality breaches and medication diversions, uh, but they're, the list is a, about four times longer. So it, it really is aligned um, with what we see in other states. So any allegations of physical, sexual, verbal abuse or neglect, um, the death of any client who is either active in a program or a uh, 
death of a client within 30 days of discharge, uh, if a client elopes out of a program or is missing for eight hours of more, uh, eight hours or more, that's now reportable to the state. Um, medication errors that either result in client harm or could have resulted in client, har in client harm. So any significant medication errors are now reportable, uh, as are medical emergencies, which include things like self-injury, suicide attempts, um, any overdose, health emergencies, um, serious illness and injuries. All of that stuff has to be reported up to the state now. Uh, the one that was a surprise to me personally is misappropriation of client property. So if you run a residential program, um, not only are you required now to, um, to document client belongings, but if client belongings go missing, even temporarily, that's now a state reportable incident. Um, the second area that I saw a, a lot of updates is in management of complaints and grievances. They're called disputes and grievances in the new rules, uh, but, but some of the new requirements that go along with that is uh, an annual a log that has to be uh, provided to the BHA every year. Uh, this is one of the areas that Parker mentioned earlier in the presentation that the BHA is responsible for a statewide behavioral health grievance system, and we're seeing that reflected in the rules here. Um, the other big change that goes along with grievances is that in addition to notifying clients about uh, your complaint and grievance process at admission, if a client comes with uh, comes forward either verbally or in writing with a dispute or a grievance, at that time, the organization has to inform them that you can also grieve to the BHA and provide information on how to do that. So that is a, a pretty big difference to from how um, things are being managed previous to now. Uh, another huge change is the requirements that go along with a quality management program. So the former rules required um, some type of quality improvement plan that included clinical quality measurement of performance and some type of clinical record review twice a year, and then response to significant events and, and risk areas that might come up. The new rule requires a written plan. It's got to be reviewed annually. It's got to go to your board of directors or your governance. Uh, in some way or form, there's a, a minimum set of things that have to be included in the plan. So um, that list is uh, things like negative treatment outcomes. You have to do an analysis of your complaints and grievances, your critical incidents, your uh, any other unusual incidents that occur in the organization. Um, and in addition to that, uh, regulatory issues and findings that come up. So that's the minimum set. Um, the organization has to identify what data you're going to be monitoring and what you're going to do with that. And then uh, in addition to that, any performance improvement projects uh, and the rationale for why you're doing those. Uh, basically, the, the new rules are going to enforce a documentation of the performance improvement cycle. And that's really outlined in a, in significant detail in these new rules. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. And I think you know the requirements historically for performance and quality improvement has really lacked in the state. And mm -hmm. it's great to see that they're graduating this part of their expectations, and also you know an area of strength and expertise with our team on the services side and in being able to use our platform as well. So a great opportunity to explore the tools and resources that we have available to address some of those additional regulatory requirements around quality improvement. So the screening and assessment requirements are also an area that um, there's been a lot of updates. Um, there's we're not going to, we don't have time to get into all of the details of what's required, but it, it does, the new rules breaks that process up into screening, initial assessment, and comprehensive assessment. There's required documentation timeframes uh, by program and level of care, but I, I think it, it reads like 
um, the BHA is trying to build in some flexibility with regards to clinical urgency um, so that that screening process is really designed to evaluate the urgency of the clinical need and imminent risk and, and other risk areas and give that preliminary level of care determination. So if you need to get somebody into treatment immediately, you can do a, a minimal set of initial assessment, get them into treatment, start providing services, and then you've got um, another window of time based on what type of program you have uh, to get the rest of that comprehensive assessment completed. Um, and then a I really don't want to get into restraint and seclusion and physical management rules, but if you are an organization that provides those high risk interventions, uh, know that where the old rules are very thin, the new rules, there are pages of requirements outlining every aspect of it. Um, and they're really aligned with Joint Commission hospital standards for uh, physical restraint and seclusion. So I, I just wanted to mention that in case we've got any um, any organizations that provide those interventions. So, okay. So um, I mentioned some of these things earlier, but if you are an existing organization and you've not started your BHV licensing process yet, um, the the obvious question is, what's the first thing that I do? What I would recommend is because there's not delayed enforcement on critical incident reporting, the first thing to do is to start there. Get your incident reporting policies and procedures updated to reflect the new rules. Make sure your, in, your internal uh, reporting processes are solid and make sure your staff are um, trained up and, and good to go with regards to incident reporting. And then uh, I would do num the second and third things really at the same time. Get those initial licensing things taken care of. Get your letter of intent submitted. Get that fingerprinting process uh, in place for your executive director and get the application in for your cert certificate of compliance from uh, Division of Fire Protection because those are things that can hold up your license. Um, and then we mentioned this in multiple different times, but the, the policy and procedure revision that is going to be necessary with these rules changes, uh, it's going to be a lot. Um, so I would jump into that at, without delaying. And uh, if you need help with that, that's something that you know we are we've already started on our end working with some organizations to do this. Uh, if you need help doing this, we can help you with it too. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Nikki. And just really quickly, while we have the time, I'm going to do a brief tour um, of how our platform can uh, address some of these additional requirements. So on the last slide, Nikki had indicated um, critical incident reporting and those standards becoming more stringent. Um, we're in the process of designing our incident management forms uh, to be cohesive with those different standards. So individuals have the opportunity from any device, phone, tablet, or computer to submit anonymously or by name. They can choose their locations since they would be pre-populated in here. Choose the most important department that would need to follow up on it. Um, you know, when the incident happened, the date and time specifically, uh, who was involved, the altercation or incident type, whether it be critical or otherwise, you can see that we have three different levels of severity. The task that gets um, populated when a form is submitted for an incident is uh, dictated on a follow-up cadence respective to the level of severity. So there is a critical incident form that OBH ha or BHA rather has that you're required to use. But if you are using our system, you're able to document it, you're able to follow up on it, and then you're able to copy and paste data from our forms into theirs submit it and streamline that process and also make sure that you're following these rules that we know that they're going to be very stringent in regards to. Um, and then in terms of policy management, the tool uh, not only effectively houses them, um, but if there's new providers that want to onboard, um, part of the benefit um, would be access to our library of policies addressing some of those BHA rules. So make sure that you um, find a way to get in touch with us 
Um, this is a very challenging change, but if we take the approach of um, you know, adopting and addressing and improving alongside these additional requirements and regulations, ultimately everybody wins, all the stakeholders. You're gonna get paid more from the commercial, uh, the CMS, um, the private pay. You're going to stay in a satisfactory position with the regulatory authorities. You're gonna be able to push back how often they come out if you're really showing an adherence to their requirements and standards. Um, and so this is really a very important and opportune time uh, to be able to um, steep yourself into this specifically. So um, Gina, if you wouldn't mind dropping these resources into the chat, both our website and the BHA um, rules, people can reference those. We can send them out afterwards as well. Um, and then these are some of the ways that you can most quickly and easily get in touch with us. So if you message Jessica Ortega, jortega at simplifiance.com, she can get back to you quickly and set up a call about how we can help. Um, you can visit our website at simplifiance.com. And then if you're planning to attend the winter symposium uh, in Colorado Springs uh, in a couple of weeks, um, I'm actually presenting um, with Tom Miller, the deputy director of the BHA at the keynote luncheon on February 6th at 12.15 p.m. Uh, it is $55 to attend, but Tom Miller will be explaining in depth all of the BHA changes. I'll be talking about how to navigate them, uh, as well as the other regulatory changes that are coming in our industry. Um, and I do believe that we still have some conference passes. Each of those are worth over $500. Um, if you're looking to attend the Winter Symposium and you haven't gotten a ticket yet, um, get in touch with us and we may be able to um, grant you some of those passes and uh, get you in the attendance at that conference specifically. So unless Nikki, there's anything else that you think is relevant to share, I think we can conclude our time together and give everybody a half hour to take a walk, grab some lunch, um, do a little breath work. It's a very uh, strenuous environment that you're working in if you're a treatment provider. And so we have a ton of respect for what you do. Um, we're here to help. We're here to simplify and make this as easy as possible um, and deliver you the resources that you need to be successful. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Parker. Thank you, Nikki. Um, we will have this recording available. If you're interested, please email me at gina at simplifiance.com and we'll make sure you get it. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.